Vera adjusted the blanket on her sleeping daughter. The little one was sleeping so sweetly, so serenely. The girl felt safe, as her mother was nearby. For a child who had just turned one, this was enough for happiness. And Vera felt it was her duty to ensure her little one's protection, to give her everything needed for a happy childhood. Yes, it was a significant responsibility. When she first learned of her pregnancy, she hadn't even considered that parenthood was such a huge responsibility. Probably because Max, the father of their child, was by her side. It was assumed that all the worries and troubles would be shared between the two parents, making it much less burdensome. Vera believed Max would be a wonderful father. He had promised. It was Max who dreamed of a child, who asked and wanted to become a father as soon as possible. Vera. She would have waited a bit longer until they were more stable, with their own apartment. But her husband assured her that many people live in rented homes and still become parents. Everything will come in time, he assured. Now is the best age for us to become parents. Besides, children are a powerful motivator to achieve something. Max spoke passionately and convincingly. Vera didn't notice how she began to share her husband's viewpoint. She trusted him greatly then and believed that everything he said was the ultimate truth. Vera had a complicated history. She grew up without a mother, who died the same day Vera was born due to a difficult childbirth. Initially, her father and grandmother, her father's mother, took care of her. Then it was just her father, as her grandmother passed away. Vera barely remembered her, she was too young. Soon after, Tatiana came into their home, brought by her father, who was tired of living alone and found it hard to juggle work and taking care of a small child. Feelings likely also played a role. Vera saw her father truly loved Tatiana and even felt a bit jealous. Her father now rarely paid her attention, focusing first on his new wife and then on their new children together. Vera. Somehow, she just faded into the background. She had a stepmother. Initially, they had a good and warm relationship. Tatiana enjoyed walking with her stepdaughter, dressing her up like a doll. She liked her new role as a mother and wife, having long sought to marry. But it never seemed to work out. Her suitors were not serious about marriage. Tatiana's friends had long been raising children, and she still hadn't. Now she had a family, a nice, non-drinking, well-earning husband by the standards of their small town, and a daughter. A beautiful, sweet girl, a doll Tatiana had dreamed of since childhood. Then Tatiana had her own daughter, little Irina. Vera was genuinely happy for her sister, feeling it was a blessing to have a sibling. But soon she realized that her stepmother and, most painfully, her father, now directed all their attention and love towards Irina. Tatiana was absorbed in her long-awaited motherhood. Vera received only short orders and reproaches. Reproaches for being too noisy, for not washing the dishes, for not tidying her room. Her father would come home from work, greet his eldest daughter with an indifferent glance, and rush to Irina's crib. They would stand there, discussing in hushed tones how the baby spent her day, admiring their miracle. Vera tried to join them, charmed by her sister, but quickly felt out of place, like a fifth wheel in the family. Two years after Irina's birth, Vera had a brother, Tioma. Her father blossomed with joy. How could he not? His long-awaited son was born, an heir, pride, and support. Her stepmother also doted on the baby. Vera now became something like a nanny for Irina. Tatiana didn't care if her stepdaughter had done her homework or had activities after school or wanted to play with friends. No, if Tatiana needed free time, Irina was handed over to Vera without discussion. When Tioma grew up, Vera looked after both kids. She received no gratitude for her efforts. It was taken for granted. An older sister looking after the little ones, what's the big deal? 
Vera wanted so badly to be praised, for her father and Tatiana to appreciate her efforts. It was tough keeping an eye on two adorable but very active and curious kids. They were the family's darlings. Her father's eyes sparkled specially when he looked at them. Tatiana couldn't help but smile while interacting with them. And Vera. She felt like an outsider in her own home. No one cared about her opinions, problems, desires, or dreams. Vera got used to playing second fiddle. It hurt, made her feel uncomfortable, and her stepmother constantly made her feel guilty. No matter how hard she tried, Vera couldn't earn her approval. She intuitively sensed that Tatiana set the mood in the house. If she liked someone, her father would also treat that person warmly. But Tatiana. Her heart was unreachable, and Vera soon gave up trying. By the ninth grade, Vera decided she would enter college after finishing school. She knew it was unlikely that her family would support her for that long. She wanted to get a profession, stand on her own feet, and leave the family where she felt like an outsider. Even Irina and Tioma treated their older sister as a second-class person and free maid as they grew up. Vera focused on her studies, which was hard. In recent years, she was too preoccupied with household chores and her family's issues. A once solid student, she had become a weak C student. Now, Vera diligently made up for lost time, staying late in the school library and studying textbooks. It was calm and quiet there, with no one to make her clean the children's room or take them for a walk. Vera achieved what she once thought impossible, she improved her grades, passed her exams well, and received praise from her teachers. But her father and stepmother, as usual, didn't notice her achievements. Irina had just performed on stage with her dance group for the first time, and Tioma had learned to ride a two-wheeled bike. The years of study flew by quickly. Vera often returned home after dark, preferring to do her homework and prepare for exams at friends' houses or the library. It gave her a better chance to complete her studies. She enjoyed learning, easily and happily absorbing new knowledge. Each day, she became more certain she had made the right choice. She eagerly awaited starting work, knowing she would be a wonderful elementary school teacher. Practical sessions in schools confirmed this. Kids listened to Vera with bated breath. She had a way of connecting with each child, even those other teachers found difficult. Her classes grasped new topics easily. Vera intuitively knew how to convey information so children would understand. She couldn't wait to start working and move out of her parents' house, to be independent and not feel like an outsider in her own home. When she received her diploma, Vera packed her things and embarked on a new life. Her stepmother probably sighed in relief. Finally, no more extra person in the house. Finally, they could live as a close-knit family of four. Her father seemed happy too. Well done, Tatiana praised Vera for the first time. You're grown up now, no more sitting on our neck. Time to make your way in life. But don't count on our financial help much. You're an adult, find your own way. And we're doing renovations, so we can't help you. Vera nodded, understanding she was on her own. Help from the family was out of the question. No one loved her here, no one cared about her. Even the house they lived in was now signed over to Tatiana and her father. Her wise stepmother had made sure that nothing would go to the outsider girl by arranging all the necessary paperwork. Vera left her childhood home with a light backpack on her shoulders and a small amount of money in her pocket, saved from her stipend over the past year. It was enough to rent the simplest accommodation in the city. This was her biggest expense, and Vera could manage to live very frugally. She managed to rent a room in a dormitory. Her first neighbors were migrant workers who didn't speak Russian and a large family of alcoholics. The walls of the former barrack were thin, the wallpaper was peeling off, and the floors creaked mercilessly. The most inconvenient part was that the kitchen and bathroom were shared by the entire floor. 
The conditions could hardly be called acceptable, but Vera, surprisingly, still felt happy and free. She no longer had to endure Tatiana's nagging or her father's indifference. She didn't have to try to please everyone. She no longer felt like an outsider or perpetually guilty. Vera hoped she wouldn't stay there long. She planned to find a job, rent her own apartment, even if it was small and isolated, and then her life would truly begin. Vera started looking for work. She had a red diploma and excellent recommendations from the school principals where she had interned. She was eager to work and teach children, but she faced challenges she wasn't prepared for. Gymnasiums and lyceums offering good salaries required experienced staff. Vera hadn't worked a single day. Some public schools were willing to hire her, but they offered very low salaries, considering her lack of experience. You have to start somewhere, shrugged the principal of one of these schools. They were short on elementary school teachers and were trying to attract the young graduate. Work a bit, gain experience. You'll get bonuses later. Why rush? You have your whole life ahead of you. Vera shook her head. The principal didn't understand her situation. Vera couldn't wait, she needed money. She almost despaired. She had a clear plan for her life, but now everything was falling apart. Staying in the dormitory was dangerous with such neighbors. She was running out of money for food. Vera needed a much higher salary than what was offered. She decided to try a completely different field and became a market vendor. She was hired by Lena, a middle-aged woman with bleached hair and a hoarse voice. Lena had several stalls at the market, selling clothes cheaply bought from a factory in Turkey. The items were of decent quality and sold at a high markup. Lena constantly opened new stalls, needing sellers for them. Market trading was not Vera's dream. She wanted to teach children, see their curious eyes, answer hundreds of questions, and create holiday scenarios for the class. But she didn't give up on her dream. She saw the market job as a stepping stone. Vera planned to save enough money to rent an apartment for a year and then find a teaching job, even if the salary was low. The main thing was to be a teacher. Everything else would follow. Lena paid Vera well. She also received a small percentage of the sales, motivating sellers to work harder. The job wasn't difficult, except for the material responsibility and carrying the unsold items to the warehouse at the end of the day. It was thanks to these heavy bags that Vera met Max. One evening, she didn't get the cart used by sellers to move heavy items. It was either broken or taken by someone else. So, she had to drag a huge cloth bag to the warehouse herself. She put on gloves to protect her hands and started pulling the bag along the ground. At first, it was fine, but soon her back and legs began to ache, and she saw stars before her eyes. No one was around to help. The market was quiet and deserted, a stark contrast to the bustling life a couple of hours earlier. Miss, what are you doing? Why are you dragging such a heavy load? Vera turned around. A young man approached her. Tall, handsome, with slightly wavy chestnut hair and laughing green eyes. He wore a simple black t-shirt highlighting his muscles and blue jeans. It suited him perfectly. Later, Vera learned that Max had been walking nearby with friends when he saw her through the fence, struggling like a determined ant with her load. Disliking the sight, he jumped over the fence and offered his help. Vera gratefully agreed, knowing she couldn't make it to the warehouse alone. Max carried the heavy bag as if it were a regular grocery bag, his muscles flexing visibly. He was clearly into sports, which Vera later found out was due to his regular gym visits. Thank you so much, Vera smiled at her helper when the bag was finally in the warehouse. You're welcome. Always happy to help, especially such a beautiful girl, Max replied. Vera blushed. The compliment from the charming stranger made a strong impression on her. She wanted him to ask her name, and as if reading her mind, he did, 
introducing himself. A moment ago, Vera felt exhausted, like a squeezed lemon after a day at the market and dragging the heavy bag. But when Max suggested a walk, she felt a surge of energy, as if wings had sprouted on her back. They wandered the city streets, talking, laughing, getting to know each other. Max had recently graduated from university and worked as an economist for an air conditioning company. His salary, as he said, was low, not the kind he had dreamed of, but there was no choice. Without experience, no one hired fresh graduates. Vera understood her new acquaintance like no one else, being in a similar situation. The difference was that Max had his mother's support. He lived with her, she paid for utilities and groceries, allowing Max to work for a pittance but in his field, to gain experience before advancing. Vera, on the other hand, had to survive on her own, with no help from her father or stepmother. Max, after hearing her story, felt even more for her. Now I want to protect and take care of you, he told her. You know, I really need that. They started dating. Max visited the market every day after work to help Vera pack and transport items to the warehouse. They walked together afterward, sometimes going to the movies or the park across town, or strolling along the waterfront, holding hands. Max often complained about his strict boss, low salary, and his mother not understanding he had grown up, still trying to control him as if he were 12 to 13 years old. Vera supported him as best she could. Vera was incredibly happy at that time. Finally, there was someone who cared about her. Max brought her flowers, took her to cafes, and was interested in her affairs. It was unusual and very pleasant. Vera's head spun with emotion. Sometimes she couldn't believe it was happening to her. Max moved in with Vera. By then, she was renting a nice apartment, a cozy one-bedroom in a residential area near the market. The barack with questionable neighbors was in the past. The move happened naturally. First, Max stayed over, then his belongings, a toothbrush, razor, some clothes, started appearing in the apartment. Vera suggested he stay permanently. She liked falling asleep and waking up in Max's arms, cooking him breakfast, feeling his care and love. Why part when they could live together? Max was happy to leave his mother's house. She's already driving me crazy with her demands, Max shared with his beloved. It turned out that Max's mother was a domineering woman, used to controlling everything. Vera was even a bit afraid of her in advance. Max continued working at his air conditioning company, handling cost estimates. The job was tedious, uninteresting, and didn't require high qualifications. Max's salary was about a third of Vera's. She worried that he might feel insecure about this. She didn't want anything to cast a shadow on their relationship. But Max had the right attitude. Vera, he said, this is just the beginning. I'll gain experience and then find something better. With my education, it's not a problem. It's just that no one is eager to hire fresh graduates. Vera agreed with every word. He was right. She was in a similar situation but had to work at the market because she didn't have the family support Max did. Despite his mother's demands, she helped him, unlike Vera's family. Lena, Vera's fair-haired employer, called her an infatuated fool. Look how well your Max has settled. He sits in an office, shuffling papers from nine to five, earning peanuts, with no ambition for more. First, he lived off his mother. Now he's moved on to you. That's not true. You're misinterpreting everything. Me? Misinterpreting? Sure. I see through people, you know. You're wrong, Lena, Vera defended her relationship. Okay, answer me this, who pays for the apartment? I do, but. Who fills the fridge with food? Whose money buys the groceries? Mostly mine, but. And him? What's his contribution to your budget? What does your darling Max spend on? 
He bought me flowers yesterday, Vera blurted out, and ordered sushi for us in the evening. And he pays for his gym membership. Lena just smirked and shook her head meaningfully. Vera tried to ignore the comments about Max living off her. It might seem that way to outsiders, but Max was working. He had a plan to gain experience and then find a better paying job. He was still young and had his whole life ahead. The important thing was that Max loved her. He often told her so. He loved her like no one else. It was so pleasant to feel needed by someone. For that feeling, Vera was ready to endure any temporary difficulties. She had no doubt that these difficulties were temporary. Lena and others couldn't fully appreciate the significance of mutual feelings. They hadn't felt, like Vera, unwanted and out of place in their own family. So, they couldn't understand how important and valuable it was to be with someone who loves you. Time passed, and Max and Vera lived together like a married couple. Max often said he was happy now. With you, I feel strong. I feel calm and good next to you. It's not like under my mother's thumb. We understand each other without words. It's something incredible. I've never felt this way. It's very precious. Vera smiled. She felt the same. Every day, she mentally thanked fate for bringing her Max. Max often went out at night to see his friends. Vera didn't know these guys, Max didn't introduce them, but she accepted her beloved's lifestyle. You wouldn't be interested. Just my buddies, we have a guy's night out sometimes, you know. Of course, Vera understood. She liked that her beloved valued friendship. The fact that he had many friends was good. It meant Max was a pleasant and sociable person. Besides, Vera didn't lack his attention. So, it was silly to be jealous of his friends. One evening, Max came home upset. Vera knew he was supposed to visit his mother after work. That's what happened. She says I'm immature and childish, Max shared his feelings. She called me spineless, can you believe it? My own mother. She's always scolding me. I've never been good enough for her since childhood. I do everything wrong. She still thinks I'm a child, incapable of adult decisions. You know what? Let's get married. Vera couldn't believe her ears. Her heart seemed to be gripped by an icy hand, making it hard to breathe. What did you say? Let's get married, Max repeated, calmer and more confident. I've wanted to propose for a long time. I was waiting for the right moment to make it special and romantic, but it just slipped out. So, what do you say? Will you marry me? Yes, of course, yes. Vera threw her arms around Max, trying to hold back tears. To her, this proposal was the ultimate proof of his love. Now, she would finally have a real family. They began preparing for the wedding. These were pleasant chores, though the young couple was financially limited. It was time for Vera to meet her future mother-in-law, Lydia Yegorovna. Vera was nervous about the meeting. From Max's description, his mother was a domineering woman, used to controlling everything. How would she perceive a potential daughter-in-law, especially one from a small provincial town with no dowry? Lydia Yegorovna invited her son and Vera to dinner. Vera was anxious, spending a long time choosing an outfit. She wanted to look impressive, elegant, and restrained. Lydia Yegorovna turned out to be older than Vera had expected. Clearly, she had given birth to Max at an older age. Vera's father and stepmother were much younger. The woman was impeccably polite but cold, like an English queen. She spoke reservedly, mostly listening and asking questions. Vera tried to gauge whether she liked her future mother-in-law. Lydia Yegorovna almost scared her. She was retired, having worked as a department head at a factory for a long time. A managerial position had clearly left its mark on her. 
Max said his mother had to retire due to a serious heart condition. But Lydia Yegorovna looked healthy. Maybe you rushed into deciding to get married, Max's mother finally said. Why is that? Max immediately retorted. Perhaps you should establish yourselves first. Max, you don't earn enough to support a family. You're not ready yet. Vera froze, feeling chills run down her spine. She sat silently, unsure of how to react. It was clear that Max's mother was against their marriage. Her intuition hadn't failed her. Lydia Yegorovna probably didn't like the idea of Vera as her daughter-in-law. Too poor, too simple. Lydia Yegorovna, a former department head who had raised a worthy son and given him a prestigious and in-demand education, likely had other plans for Max. She probably envisioned him with a girl from a well-off family, perhaps the daughter of influential parents. But here was Vera. Max argued with his mother, providing argument after argument that he was grown and capable of making his own decisions. Lydia Yegorovna smoothly changed the subject, and the evening continued, but Vera's mood was ruined. She realized her future mother-in-law didn't approve of her. The main thing was that Max loved her, but Vera still wanted his mother's acceptance. Later that evening, at home, Vera and Max discussed the meeting with Lydia Yegorovna. Max was furious. She doesn't understand that I'm an adult and can manage my own life, he fumed. The young couple decided not to have a big wedding celebration. They simply signed the papers and then had dinner together at a restaurant because they didn't have enough money for a big event. Max earned very little. Vera's salary went towards rent and groceries. Lydia Yegorovna couldn't or wouldn't help them financially, saying her savings were for her treatment. Vera's father and Tatiana immediately said they couldn't help either, having just finished renovating their new apartment. This didn't bother Vera much. Banquets, white dresses, and decorated cars weren't important. The main thing was that her beloved was by her side. And so, Vera and Max began their life together as a true family. In terms of everyday life, little had changed, but now Vera proudly wore a wedding ring on her finger and got used to her new, unfamiliar last name. The young couple rarely saw Lydia Yegorovna. Max sometimes visited his mother after work to pick up things from home and to chat. Occasionally, she invited the newlyweds for family dinners. Lydia Yegorovna no longer expressed her dissatisfaction with her son's marriage, but for Vera, the first instance was enough. She always felt out of place at her mother-in-law's house. Lydia Yegorovna maintained her usual manner, cold, restrained, impeccably polite, like a prim dowager countess. She didn't meddle in the young couple's affairs and talked about neutral topics. These family evenings had an overly formal atmosphere, and Vera always wished for the tea party to end quickly so she could leave. After some time, Max brought up the topic of children. We've been married for almost six months, he said one evening over dinner. Maybe it's time to think about having kids. It seems like it's about time. Do you want a child? Vera asked, her breath catching. She had dreamed of a baby too, but there were so many buts. Why not? I've always wanted a son. We'd go for walks, play soccer. I'd take him on hikes, like Temek takes his Vanka. It would be great. But having a child requires a lot of money. And we. Vera spread her hands. She could have reminded Max about the overdue utility bills, stretching money until the next paycheck, their tiny apartment that needed repairs and was rented with ever-increasing costs, and much more. But why? Max was aware of their situation. Yes, I understand, her husband agreed. We're not in the best position now, but this is temporary. You know, I have a good education. I can easily find a better job. He talked for a long time about how children are a powerful motivator, about how he would move mountains for the sake of their child. It sounded convincing. 
Besides, Vera had long wanted a baby. Many of her friends were already caring for their sons and daughters. These were cute, chubby-cheeked babies that made her heart ache just by looking at them. Vera decided it was indeed time. Financial difficulties could be overcome. She had Max, who was reliable and loving, and he promised to do everything for their family. So why not? Soon, Vera realized she was pregnant. She was surprised and scared because she thought it wouldn't happen so quickly. But then her anxiety turned into boundless happiness. Max seemed happy too. He took even more care of his wife than before, buying lots of fruits and making sure she didn't lift anything heavy. Every evening, he would come to the market at closing time to help move things to the warehouse. The locals even started calling him, the loader. Vera had to leave work long before her maternity leave due to some complications with her pregnancy. The doctor insisted on a more relaxed regimen. Vera couldn't continue working at the market, standing outside all day in any weather, reaching for high-hanging items, and sometimes moving heavy boxes. The doctor said it could lead to premature birth. Luckily, Vera had managed to save a small amount for a rainy day because now, without her salary, their family was struggling even more. Max was still working for pennies. He seemed to be looking for a better job but had no luck so far. Either they pile on responsibilities, or they offer training, Max grumbled after another unsuccessful interview. Despite financial difficulties, he didn't stop meeting friends, which usually ended up costing quite a bit. Essentially, he spent his modest salary on outings with his buddies. Vera suspected there were also girls in that company, as she heard female voices when she called her husband. Max, who had sworn to move mountains for their child, clearly wasn't coping well. Vera's appearance also seemed to bother him. Pregnancy didn't suit her, she had pimples on her forehead and swelling. Her belly was huge. She herself couldn't look in the mirror, but it still hurt to hear Max's jokes about her appearance. Vera wanted support and attention during this difficult period but felt increasingly alone. Her father and Tatiana had, of course, completely distanced themselves. Even Max, her beloved husband, was gradually becoming a stranger, which frightened her. Lydia Yegorovna, the baby's grandmother, was preoccupied with her health, often hospitalized and spending time in sanatoriums. One day, Max mentioned in frustration that his mother had told him they were like children deciding to have a baby, doubting anything good would come of it. These hurtful words stabbed Vera in the heart, revealing that Max's mother had never fully accepted their marriage. Then Nika was born, a little earlier than expected but not critically so. Small, delicate, with a loud cry. Holding her daughter for the first time, Vera forgot all her worries and sorrows. She had never felt such joy before. She decided to name her daughter Nika. The tiny baby looked at her mother as if studying her face, getting to know the closest person in her life. Vera could barely breathe, overwhelmed by her feelings. She had never loved anyone so much. Max, who had dreamed of a son, seemed happy with a daughter. I'll teach her to play soccer anyway, he said, taking the tiny bundle from Vera. Max arranged a beautiful discharge from the maternity hospital, with balloons, flowers, and music. Lydia Yegorovna also came, bringing a big bag of gifts for the new mom and the newborn, which was touching. Lydia Yegorovna glowed with happiness, looking at her granddaughter. For the first time, she showed such strong emotions, and Vera liked seeing it. Max and his mother shared her joy and clearly loved Nika. However, Vera's father and stepmother didn't come, claiming they were too busy with work and their children. Vera wasn't surprised or hurt, her father and stepmother had long been almost strangers to her. Daily life with a newborn was filled with endless tasks, sleepless nights, and worries about the baby. Nika was fussy, often crying and sleeping little. It was a real test for Vera, but she tried to endure it stoically. Max, however, didn't seem to envision fatherhood this way. 
His initial excitement about the baby quickly faded. Nika's crying irritated him more than anything. He started sleeping in the living room with earplugs to avoid the noise. I need to sleep. I have to work in the morning to earn money, don't forget that, he would scold Vera. So, you need to calm her down. I need my rest. Vera didn't argue or feel hurt. Instead, she felt guilty for not being able to provide peace at home and considered herself a poor mother. She was overwhelmed with responsibilities. Nika constantly dirted her diapers, needed to be fed on a schedule, taken to the clinic, and cared for and developed. Daily walks were a must, as Nika only slept peacefully outside. Sometimes Lydia Yegorovna would visit, always bringing gifts. She smiled at her granddaughter, spoke to her softly, and Nika would immediately calm down, giving Vera a moment to catch her breath. Despite her cold and prim exterior, Lydia Yegorovna clearly had a warm affection for her granddaughter, and Nika sensed it, reaching out to her with little hands. Lydia Yegorovna also helped the young family financially, buying some groceries, clothes, and medicine, but she couldn't do much. Her serious illness consumed most of her money. Physically helping Vera with the baby was also beyond her capability, or maybe she just didn't want to. Vera was still unsure. Lydia Yegorovna seemed to adore her granddaughter but remained cold towards Vera, perhaps unable to accept that her son had married someone below her standards. Max, who had promised to move mountains for his child, wasn't living up to his promises. Max continued to work at his low-paying, easy job, unwilling to even consider side jobs or attend interviews. I'm exhausted, he explained to Vera. The baby cries all the time, and I can't relax at home. How can I do anything in this state? Max increasingly stayed out all night, disappearing with friends from Friday evening to Sunday morning, frequenting bars and parties. During this time, Vera struggled alone with the restless baby. Sometimes she didn't even have time to cook, let alone clean the house. This angered Max. The house is always dirty, and there's nothing to eat. I'm sick of sausages and pasta. It's hard for me to keep up with everything. Nika is teething and fussy. Other people manage. Everyone has kids, but their homes are clean and meals are prepared. You're home all day. Is it really that hard to keep things in order? These words made Vera feel even more inadequate and guilty. She tried her best, but it was never enough. One day, Max announced he wanted to live separately. My mother is going to the hospital in St. Petersburg for almost a month. I'll stay at her place. A whole month? Yes, I need to rest and get myself together. I work all day and can't find peace at home. Max packed his things and moved out. Vera sensed it was the end. She immediately thought of another woman, and it turned out to be true. Max had indeed met a woman at a club. Jeanne was ten years older, divorced, wealthy, and independent. She had two children from a previous marriage to a prominent businessman. Jeanne now worked as the chief accountant at an IT firm, earning a hefty salary. She could afford a young, handsome lover. Max captivated her with his looks and charm. He still looked like a TV heartthrob. Max offered Jeanne youth, beauty, and passion, while she offered him money. He invited her to his mother's apartment since Jeanne didn't want to bring him to her place with her children. Their relationship progressed quickly. Vera found out that Max was at an expensive resort from his social media posts. He posted a selfie against the backdrop of a luxurious beach, sporting a bronze tan and a branded shirt. Saying Vera was shocked would be an understatement. She didn't know about Jeanne then. Max didn't answer her calls. When he returned home, he looked tanned and glowing but distant. He explained the situation to Vera. You see, I've fallen in love for the first time in my life. It happens. You shouldn't hold me back. We're getting a divorce. 
But what about me? What about Nika? Vera was in despair, frantically thinking about how she would manage. The baby was just a year old, too young and frail for daycare. Vera couldn't work. She had no help. How would she pay the rent or buy groceries? Max's salary, although small, had helped them stay afloat. Her own savings were long gone. Vera had hoped they would get through this tough period. She had envisioned them walking through the city together as a family, sitting in cafes, going to the amusement park. And now, she was alone again, with a small child. I love her. She drives me crazy, Max continued, seemingly oblivious to the pain his words caused Vera. And spouses aren't each other's property. As for Nika, I'll still be her father. I'll help out. Vera shook her head. She had serious doubts. Max, as her husband, hadn't been very supportive of the family. Now, with a new woman in his life, she didn't expect that to change. Max packed his things and left to live with Jeanne. He seemed genuinely happy with her. His social media pages frequently featured photos and videos from parties and resorts. Max seemed to fit right into this new lifestyle. Vera, on the other hand, was left alone with a host of problems. First, she needed to buy expensive medicine for Nika. Second, the rent was due soon. Help came from an unexpected source. One morning, Lydia Yegorovna arrived at her apartment. It was unusual, Lydia Yegorovna had never visited them before. She looked pale and a bit disoriented. Vera knew from Max that Lydia Yegorovna had recently undergone another heart surgery. As I thought, it happened, the older woman said sadly, shaking her head. Do you think I was wrong when I said Max was too immature to marry and have children? I doubt he'll ever grow up to that responsibility. Vera lowered her eyes. Had her mother-in-law come to scold her? Max is an immature person, only interested in partying. He married you to prove to me that he was grown and independent. I suspect he wanted a child for the same reason. No, we were in love, and... I know better, Lydia Yegorovna cut her off decisively. At that moment, a sleepy Nika approached. Seeing her grandmother, the little girl smiled and reached out to her. Lydia Yegorovna smiled too, looking nothing like a prim countess. She picked up Nika and sat her on her lap, stroking her hair. I came here for a reason. You and Nika clearly need help, am I right? Vera nodded. There was no point in denying it. She was struggling alone. I know you can't rely on your parents. Max told me your story. It's sad, but I... I was also an outsider in my own family, so I understand what you're going through. Really? Vera was surprised. Yes, really. I had a stepmother and two stepsisters, just like in a fairy tale. And I, like you, once found myself alone with a child. The difference was that I was already in a managerial position, lived in my own apartment, and was much older. But still, we have a lot in common. Vera looked at her mother-in-law as if seeing her for the first time. She realized she knew nothing about her. In short, Lydia Yegorovna concluded, you and Nika will move in with me for now, until you get back on your feet. Vera stood there, stunned. Her mother-in-law, who had always kept her distance and barely spoke to her, was now offering significant help. Vera had been racking her brain, wondering how to come up with money to extend the rent and not end up on the street with her child. This was a gift from fate. Vera's life changed once again. At Lydia Yegorovna's, she felt comfortable and safe. No, they didn't become close, but they were at least pleasant neighbors. Lydia Yegorovna gave Vera and Nika the largest, sunniest room. She took her granddaughter for walks, giving Vera a chance to rest and take care of her own affairs. However, the older woman often had to be hospitalized, 
her health deteriorating. Vera and Nika visited her in the hospital. Max had been wrong. His mother wasn't emotional, affectionate, or talkative, but she was reliable and decent, which was much more important. The only problem was the lack of money. Max was living it up with his new partner, as his social media posts showed. He wasn't officially employed, having quit his previous job. The fixed alimony Vera received was a pittance, barely enough for bread and milk. Meanwhile, Max drove expensive cars, wore branded clothes, and visited the world's most famous resorts. Lydia Yegorovna was ashamed of her son's behavior, and Vera could see that. Genes are what they are, Lydia Yegorovna would sometimes say, shrugging. His father was the same way. Flitted through life like a butterfly, never acknowledging responsibility. He disappeared as soon as he found out I was pregnant. And there are probably many more Maxes like him across the country. I never counted on him, knowing what kind of person he was. The child support Vera received was also insufficient to keep them afloat. Lydia Yegorovna's pension was consumed by her medical expenses. Vera started contemplating finding a part-time job. But who would hire her with a small child? Nika wasn't even old enough for daycare yet. A solution was proposed by a neighbor who knew about the family's situation. My granddaughter started first grade this year, she told Vera while they were out walking with their daughters. The question of who would pick her up and drop her off came up. My son and daughter-in-law work, and we, the grandparents, live far away. So, they started looking for a nanny. They found a young woman who was on maternity leave. She looks after Aliska for decent pay. My kids are happy to pay her, she's a good, honest woman. Finding a good nanny is hard. You could do the same. I could, of course, Vera beamed. How had she not thought of this before? When you post your resume, be sure to mention that you have a degree in education. That's a huge plus. That evening, Vera posted ads on several platforms. Calls started coming in almost immediately. Vera thought that as soon as she started, she would find work quickly. But it was more challenging than she expected. Some conditions didn't suit her, and some employers didn't like the idea of hiring a nanny with her own child in tow. Vera had no other option. One day, a call came from an unfamiliar number. Not expecting much, Vera answered. Hello, a woman's voice said. I'm calling about the nanny ad. The conversation was lengthy and detailed. They needed a nanny for a four-year-old boy named Motvi, an unusual child. He had no specific diagnosis but was very withdrawn, becoming so after his mother's death when he was a year and a half. The cheerful, open boy had turned into a detached, unemotional child. Doctors, even the best, had tried to help him. His father could afford renowned neurologists and experienced professors, but nothing changed. Motvi only communicated with a limited circle of people, his father and the housekeeper, Ella Ignatyevna, who treated him like a grandson. It was she who was calling and searching for a nanny. We need someone who can connect with the boy, Ella Ignatyevna explained. Many nannies have tried to befriend Matvi, but he rejects them all. He needs to socialize and go for walks. School is not far off, and we are desperate. I would be happy to meet Matvi, Vera replied. She was intrigued. It was like a challenge, a complex problem to solve, and she was eager to succeed. But you must understand, I have a daughter. She just turned one inch. That's not a problem, Ella Ignatyevna assured her. If you fit in, it won't matter at all. And so Vera found herself standing on the porch of a large mansion. It felt like a different world, well-kept gardens, gravel paths, a small fountain near the gate. It was quiet and peaceful. Vera felt a bit nervous. Ella Ignatyevna opened the door, smiling at the sight of the baby in Vera's arms. What a lovely girl. 
the housekeeper said, welcoming them inside. I really hope you stay with us. In the spacious living room, a small, very thin boy sat on a soft couch. Light hair, dark, intelligent eyes, so very sad. This is our Matvi, Ella Ignatyevna said, stroking the boy's head. Say hello. The child didn't respond but looked at Vera. She smiled at him warmly, her heart aching with pity for the little boy. Matvi suddenly jumped off the couch, walked over to Vera, and patted Nika's chubby hand. The baby cooed in response, and Matvi smiled. It seemed like nothing, but Ella Ignatyevna clutched her chest with emotion. It's a miracle. I don't remember the last time he smiled at anyone. Maybe you're the one we need. Vera became the nanny. Lydia Yegorovna was pleased that her daughter-in-law found a job. Well done, Vera. Now you won't be lost, even if something happens to me. Let's not think about bad things, Vera pleaded. She couldn't bear to think of something terrible happening to Max's mother. She hoped the treatment would help. There was no warmth between them, but they were still on the same side, against the world, holding on together. Besides, Lydia Yegorovna had extended a helping hand to Vera in a difficult situation, and Vera couldn't help but appreciate it. Every morning, a car would pick up Vera and Nika and take them to Matvi's house. The boy eagerly awaited his nanny, who knew so many fun games and, most importantly, loved him. Other nannies had been cold and fake, but Vera was different. Nika also captivated Matvi. He watched over her, played ball with her, and made her laugh. Vera and Matvi would exchange smiles, and the boy seemed to warm up before their eyes. Vera herself didn't understand what made her different from the previous nannies, some of whom had psychology degrees. Matvi ignored them but spent whole days in the park with Vera, playing and learning to read and write. Perhaps Nika played a role, as Matvi acted like a loving, caring older brother to her. It was sweet and touching. Ella Ignatyevna couldn't get enough of her favorite and grew very fond of Nika, giving her little gifts and calling her, my darling girl. Soon, the four of them became almost like a family, forming warm and kind relationships. For a long time, Vera didn't see the boy's father, who owned a network of car dealerships and spent most of his time at the main office. One morning, as usual, Vera arrived to find Matvi, but this time she saw Andrei Viktorovic. She had imagined him as a tall, strong man with a serious, stern look, but instead, he was a slim, blue-eyed, smiling young man who didn't inspire fear or nervousness. Hello, he greeted Vera. Finally, I get to meet the person who performed this miracle with my son. Matvi now interacts with people, smiles, and talks a lot. And he has learned so much. I've wanted to thank you for a long time. Vera smiled in return. She appreciated his words and was genuinely happy for Matvi. Vera quietly stepped out of the bedroom of her younger daughter, Mariana, their child together with Andre. Older Nika and Matvi were still awake, watching cartoons with their father in the living room. Andre made no distinction between his children and Nika, loving them all equally and giving them as much attention as his busy schedule allowed. Everything had happened so quickly for them. Vera and Andre had met, talked, and instantly felt like they were meant for each other. It was like a fairy tale. Despite their differences in age, financial status, and backgrounds, they felt a deep connection from the start. Vera initially tried to keep her distance, not wanting to be seen as a poor woman trapping a wealthy man. She didn't want Andre to ever think that. But he managed to break down her barriers, making the stereotype irrelevant. What mattered was Andre, Matvi, Nika, and their feelings. Lydia Yegorovna was genuinely happy for her daughter-in-law. Her health was deteriorating, and she feared that Vera and Nika would be left alone. Now, with a reliable person by their side, the elderly woman's heart was at peace. Andre even helped Lydia Yegorovna by sending her to an expensive clinic for treatment. 
They found a therapy plan for her and assured her she would live many more years, long enough to see her grandchildren marry. Vera was very grateful to her husband for this. Lydia Yegorovna often visited the young family, or Vera would take the children to see her. The elderly woman thrived in the company of the children. She could spend long hours talking with the thoughtful Matvi or playing dolls with Nika. She never tired of it. When Mariana was born, she brought even more joy to the family. Matvi, being an experienced older brother, became Vera's best helper, rocking the baby's stroller, ironing the diapers, and fetching the baby wipes. Max lived his own bright and flashy life, continuing to post picturesque photos on social media and changing his statuses to more and more glamorous ones. Recently, he called Vera. Max knew nothing about the changes in her life. He hadn't been in contact with his mother, who, whenever she heard his voice, would start scolding him for abandoning his family. Eventually, Max stopped calling her altogether. Who wants to hear such things? But now, he had reappeared, saying he wanted to meet, talk, and find out how their daughter was doing. He had been paying child support all these years, albeit a small amount. Vera smiled as she listened to her ex-husband. She knew Max well and understood what he was after. Max loved to show off and make an impression. He probably expected his ex-wife to be living in poverty with their child. He was likely looking for a new dose of surprise and admiration. The meeting, scheduled for the next morning, promised to be interesting. They arranged to meet at a cafe where they used to love having breakfast together in the past when they thought they were meant for each other. Vera purposely arrived a little late. Parking in the lot, she saw Max through the glass wall of the cafe. He was sitting at a table, dressed to the nines. Vera smirked. Her ex-husband hadn't lost his flair for drama. Max glanced at Vera's car but couldn't see the driver. He simply enjoyed looking at beautiful cars. Then Vera opened the door and stepped out onto the sidewalk with a flourish. Max's face, stretched in surprise, gave her immense satisfaction. Their conversation was brief. They had little to talk about. It turned out that Max wasn't really interested in Nika. He didn't seem eager to see his daughter, which was probably for the best. After all, Nika already had a father, a real parent who had raised her. Naturally, Max deflated when he heard about Vera's new life. He had imagined their reunion very differently. Instead, he faced disappointment. He couldn't make the impact he had hoped for on his ex-wife. In this story, Max didn't come off looking particularly good. Vera left the cafe with a light heart and a smile on her lips. At home, her children and beloved husband were waiting. He had taken the day off work to spend time with his family. They planned to visit the water park and then visit Lydia Yegorovna, who had been inviting them over and promised to make pancakes. Matvi and Nika absolutely loved them.